How are you? It's so good to see your face. It's right in front of me. It's very strange. <laughs> it's Did you have very... to take tests and all that? And Oh my God, hundreds, hundreds of tests. I continue to take hundreds of tests. We've been, you know, traveling around a bit for the press tour and it's like nobody talks to each other. So sometimes you're taking multiple tests in the same day. There's a lot of testing. All right. A lot of things have been shoved in my nose, in and around my nose, down my throat. How Take are, that, however. How are your nostrils? Are they all right? Um, they're they're okay. Yeah, I like the self-administered ones where I get to be <laughs> nice and gentle, and then once in a while you get a real oh, someone who's mad, someone who gets right up there trying to trying to clean the pipes or something. Yeah. Con- congratulations. Thank you. I I, st- I I had a couple of moments, and I'll talk about it, where I couldn't quite believe. Uh, that you were up there. I mean, not to say that you, you, I was surprised to see you up there, but I was like, I know that guy. <laughs> and he's in a Marvel movie. Have you seen the the sign on the in Young and Dundas Square? I saw it this morning. Welcome home, Simu. I saw it this morning. Uh, it really, really threw me for a loop. Nobody, of course, they wanted to, you know, the people at Disney wanted to surprise me. But uh, I was doing breakfast television, so our team, you know, we all got up at 6 in the morning, sleepy eye, like hadn't gotten our morning coffee and just coming out of the car, I was like, wait, hang on a second. Is that my face? And I look over and it, it is an astoundingly large image of me. Um, very embarrassing to the highest degree, but also, you know, what a, what a way, what, what a way to come home, you know, Young and Dundas. I mean, it's, it's a place that I remember, I remember just walking through since I was 12 years old, literally. So it's, it's pretty incredible. Did I hear you got to take your folks to the premiere? I did. Tell me about it. I did. Well, uh, they adamantly refused to be a, a, a burden on my life, and I had to um, go to great lengths to explain to them that actually they would be more of a burden if they just kept fighting with me, and they would be the, the path of least resistance would just be to let me to do what I want, which is to fly them down, put them up in a great hotel, and and bring them to their son's Hollywood premiere. Um, but the whole oh my goodness, Tom, the whole way they fought me, they they booked. The, they booked their own hotel stay at, and, and, and I'm so sorry, the Dunes Inn, a, a motel, a, one, of the, one of the ones that you see, um, you know, in TV, on TV, the ones that are like $99 a night. Side of the road, door. Side of the road, yeah, right. kind of like square shaped, hollowed out. Not what you had in mind. No. And they were so happy. They sent me pictures of the rooms and they were like, look at what a great deal we got. And I wanted, I wanted to pull my hair out. I was like, cancel that reservation immediately. I'm, you're going to the Hilton. And that was just the first of, of many of those fights that we had, you know, trying to get them out to a nice restaurant, trying to get them, I mean, to dress up for the premiere. It was just, I mean, it really all reminded me of just how how simply they've lived for so long. I mean, my, my parents came to this country with literally nothing. They lived off of scholarship money for the first, you know, five or six years that they were that they were here, um, including with me for, for many of those. Um, you know, scoured the supermarket for for whatever was on sale, whatever was discounted, whatever was about to expire, and that became what they cooked with. You know, that was their life for for so long, and so, you know, for for me now to be in a position where I could I could hopefully give them something more, despite their best efforts, uh, it, it's 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 really incredible. What did they make of it? Uh, I think they were relieved that I didn't suck. I think, you know, it's like when you're going in and you're watching, you know, you're watching your friend's project or you're watching your friend's play that they put on and you're just, you're just so nervous that it's bad because if it's bad, then you have to, you know, they ask you about it and then you have to be like, oh, well, you know, you know, you, you were you, great. You sound like a man who has had those, I've had those too. I've had those yeah. conversations yeah, yeah, many no. times. I've also been on the receiving end of those yeah, conversations before too, you know? <laughs> this show, Tom, it's, you know, you're it's, doing a good, you know what? You're, 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 doing you, a, you're still haven't been taken off the air yet, so that's something. You, you're doing it. You're doing it and that's what's important. <laughs> well, this, was, and I, I can honestly say this was such a, a great film. I wonder if you could briefly tell mm-hmm. a little bit of the story of how we got here. Um, and, and last time you were on, we, we, we kind of told the story up until Marvel. Mm-hmm. But I, you know, mm-hmm. what we didn't talk about last time was the story of the tweet mm-hmm. and how putting something out into the universe sort of mm-hmm. um, made a pretty, pretty wild dream come true. Would you mind telling us about that? Yes, but I, I, before I do that, I need to make one thing very clear. What's that? Which is that nobody read that tweet. Nobody read that tweet until I was already cast. Oh. I had forgotten that I had tweeted it. So you had tweeted, hey, Marvel, let's hey, Marvel. talk. Hey, Marvel. And then, you know, 12 people were like, Haha, this was nice. Uh, that's cute. 
maybe one person was like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that might've been my, my best friend. Um, and then, and then fast forward to, you know, a July, uh, 2019, Someone is like, hey, you did you realize you tweeted this all the way back when, right? And and that was when I remembered because you know I you know me, Tom. I tweet I tweet all the time, in inane, absolutely complete non sequitur things that are not related to anything. But anyway, um, so that was not the reason why I got this job, and it did not put me on anyone's radar. It did not do anything in the physical world. I think what it did for me on a on an internal level was just. It, it gave me a sight on the horizon to look at and say, I'm headed that way. And I don't know if I'm ever going to get there. I don't know what that sunset even looks like, but I'm, I'm just going to drive. And I know it, I have a general direction and I'm just going to see. And I was, it was at a time where I was starting to audition more in LA. And I was just, I wanted so badly just to, just to make it, you know, whatever that meant. And so, yeah, that's what I was, that's what was going on in my mind. And I think, you know, I think so often we have these ambitions or these hopes within us that we kill before we ever let it escape our lips because we are afraid. We are afraid of judgment from the world. We are afraid of failure. We are afraid of being seen as ridiculous or unrealistic or just naive. And so we never let anybody hear about it. And we keep it to ourselves until we squelch it, until it's gone. Mm. And I just... I just think what what a sad thing to to eat your dreams like to literally just eat it and um I think that there is power in acknowledging it to yourself and vocalizing it you know when, when did you get the call I got the call on Tuesday uh Tuesday July 16th it was two days after I had done my final screen test in New York I had met Aquafina for the first time you knew we, you were in the running I knew I was in the running in a in a very very real way um, I show up to this to the studio in New York. Aquafina is there. The producers are there. It is a full set. I'm getting mic'd. I'm getting my makeup done. It's as if I was spending a day on set with with Destin, our director. And it had gone really well. I, you know, Nora and I, Aquafina and I, had just gotten off to this just perfectly easy, natural kind of best friend chemistry, and it worked so well. It was funny. It was riffy, and um, yeah. So so you know, fast forward two days. 6.30 uh, in the evening, I get a call, unknown number in Burbank, California. My heart stops because I think this might be the one. And, and I pick up, it's the voice of Kevin Feige on the other side, and he's like, Simu, your life is about to change. I'll let Destin give you the news. Destin's in the background. And evidently they've had this like big meeting right before because everyone is there and Destin from kind of some far off place yells, we want you to be Shang-Chi, man. And, and that's, that was it. That was it. What'd you do? Um, I think I might have screamed a little bit. I think I may have like, you know, maybe like like scream cried, cry screamed. And and Kevin was like, okay, okay, two two things, very important. One, you're gonna fly to San Diego in four days, and we're going to announce you to the world. You're gonna go on stage. You're gonna say hi. It's gonna be great. You were like, hey guys, I have plans. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm 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 busy. I got a rezo. I have um I have a pickup <laughs> basketball game with my buddies and we play every yeah. and and then two very important we want to keep it a secret don't tell anybody and I said no problem Kevin I I get you nobody will know and then I hang up the phone and I immediately call my best friend because how do you how do you possibly keep a, a secret like that I'm sorry it's the first and only time I've ever lied to Kevin Feige it's a beautiful story. I want to talk a little bit about the film itself. Mm -hmm. I got some uh, headphones there. Would you mind popping them on just for a yes. second there? So I want to, I want to play a clip from the film. So mm -hmm. in this scene, uh, Shang-Chi reveals his true identity to his high school best friend, Katie, who you just mentioned is played by Aquafina. Since high school, she's only ever known him as Sean from San Francisco. Take a listen to this. I should also probably mention that my name's not technically Sean. What? What is it? It's Shang-Chi. Shang-Chi? No, Shang-Chi. Shang-Chi. Shang. Shan. Shang. Shan. Shang. Shang. S-H-A-N-G, Shang. Shang? Yeah. You change your name from Shang to Sean? Yeah, I don't. I wonder, yeah. how, I wonder how your father found okay, you. I was 15 years old. <laughs> That's a scene from Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings featuring my guest Simu Liu. We were talking about this. It's, it's a very short scene, but it actually feels like a very deliberate moment. Sure. Tell me a little bit about it. 
Um, I mean, I, I think I love this idea that we're showing Asian characters who grew up in the West distinctly. Uh, we, we, you know, we call ourselves diasporic Asians or Asian Canadians, Asian Americans, whatever have you, uh, Asian hyphenates. And, uh, and, and we show two characters with, with very different grasps of their, of their quote unquote mother tongue. And we have, on the one hand, we have Sean, who, who you know, can, can speak the language uh, you know, pretty well. And then we have Katie, who just has, has no idea. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's one of the many reasons I love that scene. And another one being, you know, Nora is just such a, a wonderfully talented improviser. Um, a lot of the tail end of that scene, which, which comes after the clip, uh, was, was just completely her and, and me just kind of trying to follow along, which is, which is great. And the other thing too is I love I love this idea of a, you know the duality of the names because I feel like so many uh, you know so many of my friends have two names you know so they they have their their name in their in their mother tongue and then they have their their anglicized or americanized name and um, you know I think they have they have like interesting relationships to both of them so it's it's great to just kind of explore that in the context of a of a massive Marvel movie I think that's one of the things that ma you know makes representation so exciting but, and, and, and that leads me to this thought that, like, this isn't just a role. Mm -hmm. this, this isn't just an, any other acting role. Mm -hmm. There is a tremendous amount of, I'll say, responsibility, meaning, mm -hmm. and potentially pressure mm -hmm. that comes with playing this role. Mm -hmm. how, how are you with that? I'm really good. Um, and I, I will tell you exactly why. It's pretty much thanks to one man, our director, Destin Daniel Cretton, who I think from day one disabused me of any desire to play this perfect character, which I think I think I had a tendency, you know, when, when I was first auditioning for this role and I was imagining the the person that would take on the mantle of the first Asian American superhero in the MCU, I was like, what a guy that must be. He must be six foot five. He must be shredded among, you know, beyond belief. Yeah. He must be a world-class martial artist. And, you know, all of the things that I had put into my head and I was like, I am none of those things. How would I ever get this role? Um, you know, day one of sitting down with Destin, he told me, it doesn't matter. Like, I, I did not choose you because you were a good martial artist. I did not choose you because you were tall or because you were handsome or because, you know, I chose you because you're a good human. And what the world needs more than anything is to see a human being who is also Asian, you know? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I think, I think that just put everything in perspective for me and going to work every day became not about being perfect or, or, you know, living up to this, to this idea of being the one person to shoulder and to be, you know, without flaw, it's to lean into flaws and to lean into imperfection and you to show yourself. the world. Exactly. To let let people into my insecurities and vulnerabilities. And yes, even my the pressures that I face, you know, being the lead of a movie, just let all of that show in the character because it, it all in, in a way parallels Sean's journey as he's juggling the expectations of his father, as he's struggling to find himself in San Francisco away from his family, as he's struggling to move on from this from this terrible tragedy that has torn his family apart. Um, I just had this conversation about two hours ago, actually, with uh, Riz Ahmed. We were talking about his new film. Mm -hmm. And we and we talked about how there's a couple of paths in front of you as an actor sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, one is that if, if you feel um, a correction needs to be made in our society, you make it through your work and through the roles you take on. Mm -hmm. And then we talked a little bit about the study he did um, studying Muslim representation mm -hmm. in, in film and TV. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we talked about was, you know, where does this other part come from? Mm -hmm. the, the part to not just through your own work, but through through advocacy as well. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was something I wanted to put to you as well. Because mm -hmm. it's not just through your work, it's through your writing, it's through your social media, it's through mm -hmm. your, the way you speak. Mm -hmm. Where does that come from in you? It comes from a lifetime of being told to keep your head down, to do the work, and to not ask too many questions, not rock the boat. I think that is almost, in a way, the immigrant creed. It is, don't cause a ruckus, put, you know, roll up your sleeves, let's just do this, don't complain. 
and um, and just get through it. And I think in our community, I I see the limitations of that. And you know, I, I want to say too, it's probably the case. Um, I'm just not that subtle of a human being. <laughs> and so the straight line A to B path for me that, that kind of addressed this issue was to start to get squeaky. You know, the squeaky wheel gets the oil and my parents had spent a lifetime not making any noise. And I was like, what happens if I do this? What happens if I rock this? What then? You know, will anybody listen? And, um, you know, I've had the I've had the fortune of of being a part of you know Kim's convenience for so many seasons, and and it was you know we were constantly being asked these questions about diversity and representation, and I just you know in the beginning I think I shied away because I didn't know I didn't know how to answer them. I, I was a performer. I you know not that long ago had just dressed up as Spider Man with a Walmart suit and tried to entertain kids at birthday parties, and now I was being asked to speak on behalf of my entire community. Um, but then I kind of looked to my left and I looked to my right and I looked at my friends and I thought, what would it be like to, to have somebody like that that was speaking about the issues? Is there anybody like that right now? And if not, who, uh, you know, when, when we just pass off responsibility or we pass that duty off, where, where will it fall if we had that option? So I, I, I guess I just started leaning in and, and you know, got such a groundswell of support and, you know, from, by the way, many of them being fans of the show as well, saying, thank you for representing us. Thank you for speaking out. And, and it was clear that I was speaking to them on it on a deep level. And it was clear that they were resonating with the messaging. So I think just, I just kept doing it. I just kept doing it. And people just kept saying what you're doing is, you know, and, 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 and I guess fast forward to today. Do you feel like you got to say goodbye to Kim's convenience? No. No, I didn't. Um, I feel like I got to say, see you in a bit. And then, you know, we had the, we had the rug pulled out from, from underneath us for, you know, reasons that uh, you and I both know, you know, that they've, that they've been reported on. And um, I feel like um, if you were to ask me if I was proud of the work that we, that we did over our five seasons, 65 episodes, I would say yes. If you were to ask me if I adored working with Paul and with Gene and with Andrea and Andrew and Nicole and every single person on the cast and crew of Kim's Convenience, I would say absolutely yes. Um, but if you were to ask me if I felt like the show reached its full potential, I would say absolutely not. Um, I think there were a lot of missed opportunities with the show. And I know we, we, we talk a lot about that last season that, that should have happened or that season six, but I, you know, as I'm sure you, you know I've written about, I, I, felt like, I felt like our show was lacking in representation behind the camera. I felt like for a show that was so celebrated for its distinct Asian Canadian voice that we, we actually didn't have one. And um, you know, I think that impacted the level of storytelling and the quality and the authenticity of the character arcs. And, um, you know, I, I felt that Kim's Convenience was at a, at a core, at its core and at its strongest, a show about family, um, a coming of age of, of, you know, two siblings and also, you know, detailing the struggles of an immigrant family and, you know, raising two kids, two millennials in, in Toronto. And, and I think it became something a little bit more watered down and a little bit more slapstick in later seasons and and what i wanted for it so badly was to just return to that place of emotional truth and to showcase the authentic lived experiences of minorities living in toronto and in canada and um you know, I, I regret that it was a missed opportunity. And, and it sounds like, I mean, I think I, I surprisingly, I'm not going to ask you about the, your Facebook post, but mm -hmm. I did, I did um, read you the Hollywood Reporter article mm -hmm. where you talked about it. And you said for the showrunners to say that they were moving on, it was always our belief that there were other voices of color that could fill that void mm -hmm. and continue to create authentic stories for these characters. So you're saying it didn't have to be the end, even if the showrunners left. That's right. That's right. Um, there were many people who I feel like could have stepped in and filled that void, some of whom I went to work with, some of whom I w was lucky enough to call my friends. 
some of whom had played their roles faithfully for long before the show was ever created, you know, when back when it was a play at the Toronto Fringe. And, um, and, I, and I truly, truly believed that we had all of the tools and the talent available to us to create an amazing sixth season. It doesn't... It doesn't um... How does it change? Because it was a transformational show for you. Absolutely. I know you, you, you and I have talked about that before. Mm-hmm. How, how does that make you change the way you look back on it? Or does it? This is hard. I, I, don't want to, I don't want to have an entire chapter of my life tainted by yeah. that one thing. Um, I think I recognize that the ending was not perfect. I recognize that there were aspects of our entire working culture that were not perfect and that didn't cultivate the voices of, you know, of, of minority talent and minority writers. Um, but that being said, I owe a tremendous amount to the show and to everybody involved in the creation of the show. And I remain grateful for that. Well, let's let's close things off this way. I mean, mm-hmm. I've been fortunate enough to sort of talk to you through the whole journey. Mm-hmm. I got to talk to you around the times Kim started. I got mm-hmm. to talk to you throughout the show. I got to talk to you while you were filming mm-hmm. um, Shang-Chi. And now I'm, I'm getting to talk to you as it's about to get even bigger. Everything is about to get even bigger mm-hmm. for you. And I'm just excited to, to see, see it happen. Thank you. What's been the most rewarding part of this journey for you? I think it's, it's, God, it's so hard to articulate this. For, for the first time, I'm at a loss for words, really. Um, I think it's, it's giving kids something that I would have really loved uh, when I was younger. I think, I, 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 and what I hope to be is, is a voice telling them that you belong and that you deserve to be here, that this is not your, you are not, you know, an away game, you are the home game and you're the home team. And, you know, you, yeah, this is, this is your home. Um, I never had that growing up, you know. It's um, a powerful film. It's a great film. Mm-hmm. And um, it's great to see you. And con- congratulations, man. Thank you so much. It's good to be here. Simu Liu stars in the new Marvel film Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings, which opens in theaters on September 3rd.